Hi, this is Peter from Anatomy Zone and in this clinical anatomy video, we'll be learning about the pathology of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Let's take a coronal section of the brain and zoom in to take a closer look at the meninges. The brain is encased by three membranes known as meninges. The tough outer layer is called the dura mater, the second layer is the arachnoid mater, and the innermost layer, which adheres to the brain surface and follows its gyri and sulci, is the pia mater. Understanding the anatomy of the arachnoid mater is key to understanding the mechanisms and pathology of subarachnoid hemorrhage. The arachnoid mater is the middle meningeal layer and gets its name from its spiderweb-like appearance. Here you can see that there are thin filaments known as arachnoid trabeculations, which traverse the subarachnoid space and blend with the pia mater. The arachnoid layer is a thin, transparent membrane which serves to cushion the central nervous system. Unlike the innermost layer, the pia mater, it doesn't follow the gyral and sulcal contours of the brain and provides a loose-fitting covering. Between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater is the subarachnoid space. This is a normal anatomical space that is filled with cerebrospinal fluid and also contains cerebral vasculature. Damage to one of these vessels can therefore fill the subarachnoid space with blood, and this is what a subarachnoid hemorrhage is. When blood gets into the subarachnoid space, it irritates the adjacent meningeal layers. This irritation gives rise to the classical triad of symptoms of meningism, which includes neck stiffness, photophobia, and headache. Meningism is not specific for blood within the subarachnoid space and can be caused by anything which inflames or irritates the meninges and is also commonly associated with bacterial meningitis. Subarachnoid hemorrhage can be traumatic or spontaneous. Most cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage are due to trauma but of the spontaneous or non-traumatic causes, by far the most common cause is rupture of an intracranial berry aneurysm. These make up approximately 85% of the cases of spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage. An aneurysm is a dilatation or bulging of the wall of a blood vessel. This pathological dilatation weakens the vessel wall and it can rupture, leaking blood into the subarachnoid space. I've just switched to a model demonstrating the major intracranial arteries. If I rotate to an inferior view, you can see the circle of Willis and its main branches. A berry aneurysm is a saccular aneurysm which most frequently occurs at the junctions between the major intracranial arteries at branching points from the circle of Willis. Here you can see an aneurysm which is formed at the junction of the anterior cerebral artery and the anterior communicating artery. Like this aneurysm that we see here, the majority of berry aneurysms are located in the anterior circulation, which arises from the carotid system, with a minority found in the posterior circulation, which arises from the vertebro basilar system. Rupture of an aneurysm is a potentially catastrophic and fatal event. A ruptured aneurysm can be treated endovascularly by interventional radiologists who may use coils or stents to secure the aneurysm or by neurosurgeons who can stop the bleeding by clipping the neck of the aneurysm. The second most common cause of spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is worth knowing about, is perimesencephalic hemorrhage. As the name suggests, this is blood within the subarachnoid cisterns around the midbrain. In this type of subarachnoid hemorrhage, no cerebral aneurysm is identified, and the cause of bleeding is thought to be venous in origin. In cases of perimesencephalic hemorrhage, blood will be seen anterior to the midbrain and the pons. Due to the suspected venous origin of the blood, prognosis in this type of subarachnoid hemorrhage is significantly better than hemorrhage due to a ruptured arterial cerebral aneurysm. There are several other much less frequently occurring causes of blood within the subarachnoid space. For example, arteriovenous malformations, inflammatory causes like cerebral vasculitis, and spontaneous bleed secondary to anticoagulation, among many others. So that completes this tutorial looking at the clinical anatomy of subarachnoid hemorrhage. 
For more detailed anatomy tutorials on these relevant topics, you can check out my tutorials on the meninges of the brain and the circle of Willis. If you have found this video helpful, hit the like button below and subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching.